It may come as a surprise, but atheism, as the absence of a belief in deities, is the oldest worldview of modern humans and predates the first religion by 190,000 years. It developed in Africa some 200,000 years ago and spread wherever human beings went to live. The first group of Homo sapiens, sometime during the Middle Stone Age, probably lifts on roots and carrion and has primitive stone tools, they know they have only themselves to thank for, and possibly their ancestors who showed them how to make and use them. None of them asks where they come from. They'd need a more complex language for that, anyway. And once they improve the ability to articulate themselves, they have more important things to discuss, coordinating hunts, for example, and agreeing on rules to live by to ensure the safety and well-being of the group. As the millennia go by, they might become curious about their origins, we don't know whether they already start asking where they come from, but we know for certain that they don't come up with any nonsensical pseudo-answers. Not just yet. A lot of humans leave Africa and start populating the rest of the world. Many of them are burying their dead, they're still atheists, though, and the burial is not a ritual but a way to remove a decomposing body from the community for hygienic reasons. Cremations serve the same purpose. Men start making figurines of naked women. They still don't believe that those women have superpowers, they just like naked women. People start painting caves. They still haven't invented the supernatural. They just enjoy painting pictures, each to their own taste and ability. Some paint buffalo, some paint spirals, and some just do a handprint. The first hard evidence of the existence of religion comes from the first written documents from about 5,000 years ago. Such as the Book of Gilgamesh and the Instruction of Dahotep both of which indicate that society at that time had been entirely religionized. It is most likely that religion is created sometime during the Neolithic Revolution from about 10,000 to 7,000 years ago, after the development of agriculture and husbandry, human communities for the first time reach sizes in which the individuals don't personally know each other anymore, and the desire to dominate such large groups must be strong in many people. However, we can imagine that nobody rules for long, and whoever comes to power is replaced by someone stronger shortly afterwards. So what would a successful ruler need to secure his power? Ideally, he would be able to justify his authority. And since there is no logical justification of his authority, he has to think of an illogical one, something like a supreme being that nobody can see and hear, apart from himself but who is all-powerful and who will squash all his enemies, who incidentally happen to be the ruler's enemies as well. Now religion is born. The idea spreads like a virus, and within a few hundred or thousand years the world is entirely infected by religion, well, not entirely. One small island community that has been separated from the mainland by the beginning of the current interglacial some 10,000 years ago stays uninfected because it was cut off from all other humans, and so Tasmania remains atheist until the first British settlement. To be frank, we don't know anything about the early stages of the religion age. But since religion was created to justify authority, we can be sure that it is totalitarian and strictly enforced from the very start, that there is no place for reason and common sense any longer and that whoever doesn't go along with worshipping and sacrificing to the new deities will be killed in their names. In a short period of time, 190,000 years of atheism are wiped out, and it is pretended that it never existed in the first place. Being rational is not an option anymore. In the beginning, the rulers declare themselves high priests, or even deities, of their cults. But over the years another caste takes control of the gods and all their business, literally, the priests. Deciding everything from the character of the deities to their rituals and sacrifices, which, of course, benefit the priests. 
many of them even manage to keep a tight grip on the ruler himself whom they can sacrifice to his subjects as a heretic at any time. Over time religions are refined to serve multiple purposes. For example, they are used to explain natural phenomena like thunderbolts and hurricanes, and the afterlife, which used to be the privilege of a few chosen ones, soon is opened to the general public. That way a subject's loyalty can be ensured by telling them that their status in the hereafter depends entirely on their obedience, servility and piety in real life. Besides authority over others, deities are also used to justify other institutions that make non-religious humans cringe, such as genocide and slavery. Of course there can't be one all-powerful deity since otherwise the world would be flawless and so the Banthines include several gods who constantly step on each other's toes. Religion becomes the greatest business, and its salesmen, the priests, not only become rich but also very influential and powerful. In Egypt, they exert so much control that the pharaohs themselves seem powerless, until Pharaoh Akhenaten decides to put an end to their activities. He simply declares that the sun god is the only god and that he is the sun god's only priest. The worship of any other gods is forbidden, and their former priests are hunted down, and killed. Neither Akhenaten nor his sun cult survive for very long, but his revolutionary concept of monotheism is picked up by a group of Semites. The concept of monotheism turns out to be quite problematic, though, especially if the world is not perfect and the deity is supposed to be omnipotent and benevolent. In order to solve the problem, they resort to Zoroastrian dualism, and they sneak an evil god into the mythology, without, of course, calling him a god. Just like religion itself, the story isn't very plausible but highly successful. But throughout history there are people who stand up for reason and sanity, even if it means risking their lives for their non-belief, of course their testimonies and memories would be destroyed but all the supposedly holy scriptures bear witness to the existence of unbelievers and infidels by warning against them. The oldest examples known to us are Greek scientists and writers. Around 2600 years ago, Thales of Miltus establishes the Milesian school, which is the first known scientific approach to explaining the world. And although they dare not deny the existence of gods, he and his followers believe and try to prove that everything can be explained without resorting to the supernatural. In order to avoid prosecution, philosophers and playwrights have their lead characters make explicit atheist statements, such as Euripides. Doth someone say that there be gods above, there are not, no, there are not, let no fool, led by the old false fable, dost deceive you. Or Aristophanes. Shrines. Shrines. Surely you don't believe in the gods. What's your argument? Where's your proof? Another possible candidate is Hippocrates, the founder of modern medicine. He is the first to claim that disease is not a punishment of the gods but the result of environmental factors, and he develops ways of diagnosis and treatment without employing any supernatural elements. One of the many stories about him tells us that he once burned down a healing temple. And even though historians dismiss the story as a legend, the telling of it clearly demonstrates his opposition to religious superstitions. Although the Hippocratic Oath he designs, and in which the practitioner swears to use his knowledge for the good of his patients, never to harm anyone, not to perform abortions or euthanasia, and to keep his patients' secrets, starts with I swear by Apollo the Healer, Asclepius, Hygieia, Panacea, and I take to witness all the gods and goddesses. This phrase is probably a legal requirement for any kind of oath in those days. Around the same time, Democritus of Abdera is the first person to formulate the law of conservation of energy which is finally proved 2200 years later. He argues that because the number of atoms in the universe never changes, that they are eternal and have no beginning and no end and without a beginning, the universe can't have been created. Consequently he demands the removal of all beliefs in gods, 
It is said that Plato wanted all of Democritus' books burned, sounds familiar? Others, such as the philosopher Epicurus, teach their followers to make the best of life. He does not deny the existence of the gods, but claims they do not concern themselves with human beings. It is possible that he was an atheist and tried to get rid of the gods by making them irrelevant to the fate of humans, just like many deists after him. 600 years after his death, the Christian writer Lactanius also credits him with what is known as the Epicurean paradox. Either God wants to abolish evil, and cannot, or he can't, but does not want to. If he wants to, but cannot, he is impotent. If he can't, but does not want to, he is wicked. If God can abolish evil, and God really wants to do it, why is there evil in the world? But even though this argument is perfectly in line with Epicurean philosophy, he is unlikely to be its author since the Greek pantheon consists of a multitude of gods, none of whom claims to be omnipotent or benevolent. Several philosophers, writers and scientists in ancient Greece, just like any other culture, are being labeled atheists, such as Socrates, but since none of their writings survive and the accusation of atheism is a common way to have one's opponents executed, these claims can be neither verified nor disproved. It also appears that in small pockets enlightened communities survive for a while, although these would be extremely rare. One that we know of is the Karvakar, or Lokyata, school in India of which we have very little information. But there are indications that its origins date back as far as 2600 years ago, and that it was still being taught around 600 years ago. Other Indian and Far Eastern philosophies have been called atheist, too. But while they don't include teachings of any deities, they don't explicitly deny their existence, either. Besides, many of them are still dogmatic, and any dogma corrupts the mind, be it religious or not. The most successful religions are the ones based on Akhenaten's model of monotheism, although, after sneaking in the evil deity, they are, technically speaking, ditheistic, which draw from a multitude of Indian, Egyptian, Assyrian and Babylonian sources for their mythology to compose the most vulgar violent and pornographic book written in human history, introducing a schizophrenic misanthrope called Abraham as their patriarch and giving detailed advice as how to kill those of other races, beliefs and sexual orientations, and how to stone disobedient children to death. Some claim their God turned nice after having killed his son, but their actions and teachings speak a different language. In ancient Rome the position of atheists is the same as in ancient Greece. The consul and philosopher Marcus Tilius Cicero phrases it quite diplomatically. The first question is, do the gods exist or do they not? It is difficult, you will say, to deny that they exist. I would agree, if we were arguing the matter in a public assembly, but in a private discussion of this kind it is perfectly easy to do so. Around this time, the Roman philosopher Lucretius writes his didactic poem De Rerum Natura, on the nature of things, which outlines in detail Epicurean philosophy and atomism. He demonstrates that since nothing can come from nothing, atoms are eternal, and therefore no creation could have taken place. He argues that all human suffering originates in the fear of deities and post-mortem punishment and torture and that ceasing the worship of the gods is the only way to create happiness for mankind. The poem also points out, why atoms have to be surrounded by empty space, the void or the inane, and even shows a basic understanding of evolution. In Judea, under Roman occupation, the native belief of the coming of a messiah meets with stories of Roman gods who are born of virgins, killed and resurrected in order to deliver their subjects from sin, and the most successful and destructive mythology of them all is created, Christianity. The more the Roman Empire spreads, the more tolerant it becomes of other cultures and religions, with the exception of Christianity, because of the Christians' open defiance of Roman law, their refusal to pay taxes and their cannibalistic doctrine, but still atheism is not an option. 
much less after the year 391 when Christians take over the empire and butcher everybody else. Starting in 610, an illiterate shepherd in Mecca creates another religion, together with a manual, the Quran, which is loosely based on the Torah and several Gospels, which he had studied under Waraka ibn Awful, a relative who is an Ebionite priest. With Islam, yet another force of Abrahamic violence is unleashed upon the world. For more than two millennia the globe is being terrorized by those who claim theirs to be the one true God, massacring all those who refuse to join them in their spree of terror, genocide, slavery, war, torture, child abuse, crusades, witch hunts, honor killings, exploitation and oppression, and besides slaughtering the members of so-called primitive religions, primitive religions as opposed to what? Are the Abrahamic religions based on decades of scientific research, the followers of the one true God even bash each other's heads in because they can't agree on how to worship him? Needless to say that anyone refusing to subscribe to any of their superstitions suffers the same fate. In the early years of Islam, some atheists speak out openly against religion and still survive. One of them is the philosopher Ibn al-Rawandi, another the poet Abul Alabama al-Mari who writes in one of his verses, The inhabitants of the earth are of two sorts, those with brains but no religion, and those with religion but no brains. But this is soon about to change. The invention of the printing press makes the spreading of ideas a lot easier and is immediately countered with censorship by church and state. Many books are indexed and banned often together with their authors, throughout the centuries, and while censorship becomes rare in Christian countries over the past few decades, it is still the norm in Islamic ones. However, censorship has become increasingly difficult since the introduction of the Internet. The Renaissance gives birth to humanism, a movement which focuses on the individual human being, with protagonists like Leonardo da Vinci and even though it is not an atheist movement per se, it paves the way for many secular philosophies. In 1513 Niccolo Machiavelli, the father of political science, finishes writing The Prince, which is a manual for political rulers how to hold on to their power and oppress the masses, it is still disputed whether he is sarcastic or serious, in his work he points out that a successful ruler must never be religious himself but that he must force his subjects into religion to secure his power. The prince is not allowed to be published until 1532. With the Reformation, alternative, and often less expensive, kinds of Christianity are introduced and unsuccessfully fought by the Roman Catholic Church. One would think that the Protestants who themselves suffer persecution would be sympathetic to the situation of other minorities, but the likes of Martin Luther. I should have no compassion on these witches. I should burn them all. And John Calvin received just as much pleasure from killing atheists and heretics as the Catholics do, and scientists whose results contradict religious dogma to suffer the same fate. One that we know of is Giordano Bruno, an astronomer who believes, like Copernicus, who was lucky enough that his theory didn't come to the Inquisition's attention until after his death, that the Earth revolves around the Sun and that all other stars are suns as well. His concept of an infinite universe is an early model of quantum mechanics. He is burned in 1600, his execution is defended as recently as 2000 by John Paul II through his cardinals Angelo Sodano and Paul Pooper, 16 years after Bruno's death, Galileo Galilei is found guilty of heresy and forced to recant and refrain from spreading his foolish and absurd heliocentric theories. By the Inquisition, when he violates this condition of his release, he is placed under house arrest for the rest of his life, escaping a more severe fate due to his connections. In 1990 Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict XVI, still proclaims that, the Church remained much more faithful to reason than Galileo himself. The process against Galileo was reasonable, and just... But two years later Pope John Paul II admits on behalf of the Catholic Church that Galileo was right. Over the years, with Socrates being the first known victim, K. 
countless philosophers, writers, scientists and others are being accused of atheism or heresy and executed, all over the world, often because their own beliefs are not in line with mainstream doctrine, or because someone influential wants them out of the way. Which of these are in fact atheists, we'll never know, neither will we ever know anything about the closet atheists. Some of the greatest men of the previous millennia are probably atheists afraid to come out, for good reasons, and as for those who admit to being atheists, we can be sure about their fate, and we can also be sure that no trace of their reasoning is left for future generations. Many believers would have us believe that the lack of known atheist manuscripts and their authors suggests that there was no atheism in those days, but the permanent warnings against unbelievers, the continuous and fruitless efforts of apologetics to prove the existence of God, and the countless persecutions indicate that they were always around, and although they are rare, there are cases we know of, for example Kasim Lizinski, a Polish nobleman, who reads a book in which the author attempts to prove God's existence. Lizinski finds contradictions which he notes at the margins, with the conclusion ergo non est deus, therefore God does not exist. Unfortunately, the book is found by Jan Brzozowska, the nuncio of Brest, who happens to owe him a lot of money and turns him over to the authorities. Later a treatise entitled De non existentia de, the non-existence of God, surfaces in which Lizinski argues that God can't possibly exist. Another bishop who was involved in his prosecution describes his execution in 1689. After recantation the culprit was conducted to the scaffold, where the executioner tore with a burning iron the tongue in the mouth, with which he had been cruel against God. After which his hands, the instruments of the abominable production, were burnt at a slow fire, the sacrilegious paper was thrown into the flames. Finally himself, that monster of his century, this be aside was thrown into the expiatory flames. Expiatory if such a crime may be atoned for. But a few decades later, in a Europe torn by religious wars, an attitude of religious tolerance starts to grow which, at the height of the Enlightenment, also suffers the voice of reason to speak up once again, in hushed tones at the beginning but soon taking a firmer stand against religious oppression. The small community of Etropny in Champagne is devastated when Father Sean Muslia dies in 1733. The priest had served the parish for thirty years, and there seemed nothing too remarkable about him, apart from the way he stood up against the arrogance of the lord of the village and the fact that he led a Spartan life, in order to give all that remained of his salary to the poor. A true Christian, one may think, provided one considers Christianity a good thing, we can imagine the type of conversations his flock has at the wake. Do you remember the time the Archbishop forced him to pray for Antoine de Tuy? Yes, and he prayed that Antoine may be converted not to run the poor and to spoil the orphans. They probably also talk about his rejection of any medical help when he got ill, and how towards the end he even rejected food just as if he had wished to die, they are in for a surprise. In Father Muslia's home several copies of a 366 pages long handwritten manuscript, addressed to his parish and entitled My Testament, appear. In which he disproves the existence of God, attributes the invention of deities to the desire to dominate others, demonstrates how religion perverts morality and apologizes to his parishioners for not having taught them the truth earlier. I would have preferred to enlighten you sooner if I could have done it safely. What remorse I had for exciting your credulity, a thousand times upon the point of bursting forth publicly, I was going to open your eyes. But a fear superior to my strength restrained me and forced me to silence until my death. I think that the fear of burning at the stake is a sufficient reason for delaying his revelation. Apparently he is afraid his testament might fall into the wrong hands and be destroyed, so he writes several copies of it, three of which survive. Over the next decades, some philosophers of the Enlightenment, such as Baron Dolbach, who quotes Muslier in saying, Ignorance and fear are the two hinges of all religion and that religion hinders moral advancement. Write atheist works which are published anonymously or under pseudonyms outside of France.
In 1748, Julien Nofre de la Metri, whose previous books had been burned already, publishes his essay Discourse on Happiness. He states that religion is the root of all evil. And he is the first author to point out the feeling of guilt which is acquired by children who are exposed to a religious upbringing. This work earns him the hatred of the rest of the Enlightenment and causes outrage even in places as liberal as the Netherlands. Fortunately he manages to flee to Prussia where Frederick the Great offers him sanctuary and appoints him court reader. The French Revolution, despite popular belief, is not driven by atheists, even though most of its participants are dedicated to the destruction of the Catholic Church which had caused so much terror and suffering in the past, and some also support the dechristianization of France. But there is only a small faction of atheists, who create the short-lived cult of reason which the deist Robespierre, on assuming his dictatorship, replaces with his cult of the supreme being. For a while at least some writers get away with calling themselves deists or pantheists rather than atheists and criticizing organized superstition. One of them is Thomas Paine, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, and the one who actually coined that name, an author of The Age of Reason. The Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the sun, in which they put a man called Christ in the place of the sun and paid him the adoration originally paid to the sun. My own mind is my own church. All national institutions of churches, whether Jewish, Christian or Turkish, appear to me no other than human inventions. Set up to terrify and enslave mankind, and monopolize power and profit. One would think that a system loaded with such gross and vulgar absurdities as scripture religion is could never have obtained credit. Yet we have seen what priestcraft and fanaticism could do, and credulity believe. With the first British settlement in Tasmania in 1803, the last known atheist community is discovered and finally destroyed, this is unless reports quoted by Charles Darwin, John Stuart Blackie in his The Natural History of Atheism and historian Will Durant are correct, which claim the existence of certain tribes namely a number of pygmy and other African tribes, who still have no religion. In the following years, atheism in the Western world is not a capital crime any longer, but outing oneself as an atheist still incurs serious repercussions. For example, Percy Bysshe Shelley is expelled from Oxford for writing an essay entitled The Necessity of Atheism, Generally considered the first outspoken atheistic manuscript in the English language, Charles Bradlaw, the first atheist in the British Parliament, is not allowed to take his seat as he refuses the religious oath. Four by elections are held to fill the vacant seat, all of which Bradlaw wins, and even though he now offers to take the oath, he is only allowed to take it on the fourth occasion. Beginning in the 1850s, many secular Humanist, atheist and free thought societies emerge in Europe and North America, and over time they spread all over the non-Islamic world, their purpose is very greatly, while some just provide an opportunity to meet like-minded people and exchange ideas, others actively promote issues, such as separation of church and state, the removal of privileges for religious organizations, equal rights and opportunities for the non-religious the removal of religious customs, rituals and displays from public life, the closing of religious schools, the removal of superstitions from school curricula and freedom of expression over blasphemy laws. Literature soon helps spreading the ideas of atheism, in particular Charles Darwin's book On the Origin of Species which presents his theory of evolution and is published in 1859, even though it is not explicitly atheist, it replaces a religious view with a scientific one, leading to a lot of controversy. Darwin himself was a devout Christian until he was about 40 years of age, and the process that led him to disbelief was, according to himself, a slow one. He calls himself agnostic because of the stigma that is attached to the term atheist. I am with you in thought, but I should prefer the word agnostic to the word atheist. Interestingly, 
It was not the discovery of evolution that drove him from Christianity but the damnable doctrine of eternal punishment for unbelievers. He, too, points out the dangerous effect religious indoctrination has on the minds of children. Nor must we overlook the probability of the constant inculcation in a belief in God on the minds of children producing so strong and perhaps as inherited effect on their brains, not yet fully developed, that it would be as difficult for them to throw off their belief in God, as for a monkey to throw off its instinctive fear and hatred of a snake. Starting with Charles Darwin the greatest scientific minds in the Western world can now openly admit to not believing in gods, and most of them do so, trying to conceal their hatred of science, believers often point out that the great scientists of previous centuries, such as Abu al-Qasim al-Zaroi, Leonardo da Vinci, Nicolaus Copernicus, Galileo Galilei and Isaac Newton were religious. Did they have a choice? Many scientists and philosophers openly promote atheism now, and with the works of Karl Marx, who calls religion the opium of the people, which allows the suppressed masses to escape reality, the concept of atheism enters the political arena, but when that concept is finally applied, atheism, for the first time, shows a rather ugly face, as can be seen in the ruthless and inhuman politics of communist dictators like Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong and Pol Pot. However, I would classify these men as believers rather than atheists, even though they don't believe in a supreme being. They and their followers believe in and enforce a doctrine, and every doctrine corrupts the minds of its devotees, no matter whether it is religious or not. Interestingly, despite being atheists in adult life, all these dictators suffered a religious upbringing. Atheism becomes tolerated to a certain extent, but there are backlashes, especially under fascism. Shortly after coming to power in Germany, Hitler starts his anti-godless movement, bans all atheist and free thought organizations and closes all secular schools. After less than a year in power he proclaims, We were convinced that the people needn't require this faith. We have therefore undertaken a fight against the atheistic movement and that not merely with a few theoretical declarations, we have stamped it out. Awareness of the importance of early childhood indoctrination for the next generation's political and religious views leads some denominations to resort to organized inhuman crimes. During the civil war in Spain, the Catholic Church begins to rob newborn children of socialist and single mothers, while the mothers are told their offspring died at birth. The church sells the children to fascist and Catholic couples, this practice continues at least into the late 1990s, and in all probability a lot longer. Though far from being the norm, there have always been a few believers who put their morality and humanity before their religion. In Nazi Germany, the likes of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Albert Wamsky defy their churches by opposing the Hitler regime and helping its victims. Around the same time Mahatma Gandhi, I'm prepared to die, but there is no cause for which I'm prepared to kill. A practicing Hindu, denounces the inhuman caste system, which is as fundamental to Hinduism, as the Eucharist is to Christianity. One may wonder whether these men are closet atheists, keeping up a religious facade in order to secure broad support for their humanitarian causes. But of course this is mere speculation. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, dedicates many of his works to analyzing the origins and the symbolism of religion. In the future of an illusion he demonstrates, that dogmatic religious training weakens the intellect by denying lines of inquiry and predicts that, in the long run nothing can withstand reason and experience, and the contradiction which religion offers to both is all too palpable. Concluding in the Hope that in the future science will go beyond religion, and reason will replace faith in God. Throughout his life, Albert Einstein refutes repeated claims that he is an atheist, as well as those that he believes in a personal God. Calling himself an agnostic at times, and sympathizing with pantheism and deist concepts like that of Baruch Spinoza, he still has no time for Abrahamic religions. The idea of a personal God is quite alien to me and seems even naive. 
For me, the Jewish religion, like all other religions, is an incarnation of the most childish superstitions. A God who rewards and punishes is inconceivable to me for the simple reason that a man's actions are determined by necessity, external and internal. So that in God's eyes he cannot be responsible, any more than an inanimate object is responsible for the motions it undergoes. Science has therefore been charged with undermining morality, but the charge is unjust, and man's ethical behavior should be based effectually on sympathy, education, and social ties and needs. No religious basis is necessary. Man would indeed be in a poor way if he had to be restrained by fear of punishment and hopes of reward after death. It is therefore easy to see why the churches have always fought science and persecuted its devotees. I cannot imagine a God who rewards and punishes the objects of his creation, whose purposes are modeled after our own, a God, in short, who is but reflection of human frailty. Neither can I believe that the individual survives the death of his body, although feeble souls harbor such thoughts through fear or ridiculous egotisms. And giving out punishments and rewards he would to a certain extent be passing judgment on himself. How can this be combined with the goodness and righteousness ascribed to him? The foundation of morality should not be made dependent on myth nor tied to any authority, lest doubt about the myth or about the legitimacy of the authority imperil the foundation of sound judgment and action. I do not believe in immortality of the individual, and I consider ethics to be an exclusively human concern with no superhuman authority behind it. Some centuries ago I would have been burned or hanged. Nonetheless, I would have been in good company. While other countries start enforcing the separation of church and state, the United States, who were founded as the world's first secular state, go the opposite direction. During the Cold War, Republicans as well as Democrats use the fact that communists promote atheism to create the impression that atheism and communism are identical. Their witch hunt under Joe McCarthy is aimed at everyone who does not conform to traditional Christian right-wing politics, and they succeed in turning the United States into a Christiocracy by adding the words under God to the pledge, printing in God we trust on their money etc. In 1971, John Lennon releases the song Imagine which instantly becomes a bestseller. The song simply envisions an ideal world without borders, wars and religion. Lennon says about it that it is anti-religious, anti-nationalistic, anti-conventional, anti-capitalistic, but because it's sugar-coated, it's accepted. Nine years later he is murdered by a mentally confused religious fan. Even though the vast majority of atheists are not organized, Imagine is considered the unofficial atheist anthem by Manny because they don't base their lives on a book teaching the inferiority of females and certain races, atheists have always been at the forefront of civil rights movements. The women's rights movement, known as second wave feminism, which begins around 1963 and reaches its peak ten years later, is no exception. Fighting against the gender discriminations of both society and the law makes perfect sense. But other than the staunch pro-lifers of first-wave feminism who fought for their right to vote and own property 50 years earlier, this movement also claims every mother's right to abort her child, calling it reproductive rights and creating the successful myth of the tissue blob. While generally atheists are better informed and think more independently, they make an exception when it comes to the issue of abortion. There appears to be a lot of pressure to conform or otherwise depending on one's gender, being branded a traitor or a male chauvinist, besides, the focus of most pro-life supporters in the discussion is on religious aspects rather than on scientific ones, which of course are not valid in an atheist's view. The science is there, we know when life begins, we understand fetal development, the facts are on our side, yet we choose to carry around signs that say pray to end abortion. And before I formed you in the womb I knew you. We approach a pregnant woman who is walking into the abortion clinic and hand her a brochure with Jesus on the front. Instead of a fetal development brochure. That facts are more effective than sermons is proven by Norma McCorvey.
the plaintiff in the infamous Roe v. Wade case, who had fabricated a rape story in order to get an abortion, being the person responsible for the legalization of abortion in the United States and working in an abortion clinic. Christians confront her with prayers, Bible quotes and death threats for two decades without any results. Then one day she sees a fetal development poster and realizes she has been wrong. She has since become a pro-life activist and campaigns to have Roe v. Wade overturned. Some atheists who are familiar with embryonic and fetal development, like Richard Dawkins in his book The God Delusion, create the most bizarre pseudo-philosophies to morally justify abortion. But despite the seemingly clear split between believers and atheists on this topic, mothers in religious countries are more likely to abort their children than in secular ones. This has two reasons, firstly, the daughter of religious parents is less likely to have received a proper sexual education, and she is also less likely to use contraceptives, therefore, she has a considerably greater chance of an unplanned pregnancy, secondly, when she gets pregnant, the atheist mother has the option to give birth to her child without feeling guilty, and in most cases does so, the religious mother, however, will be under pressure from both her environment and her conscience to destroy the evidence of her supposed sin. Since the beginning of religion, their proponents have protected their helpless gods against sharp tongues by means of blasphemy laws. A lot of countries still have these in place, with varying definitions and penalties. In many Islamic countries, it is still punishable by death. In 1988 the British Indian author Salman Rushdie publishes his novel Satanic Verses which contains a number of dream sequences, including one in which Muhammad, writes down several verses allowing the worship of ancient gods before realizing that these verses were revealed by the devil and not by God. Another sequence introduces a character loosely based on the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini. The Islamic world is outraged and Khomeini issues a fatwa calling all Muslims and their sympathizers to kill Salman Rushdie and his publishers. The fatwa is reaffirmed as recently as 2005 by Ayatollah Khamenei. Over the past few years, publishers and non-believers have become more confident and taken a step forward in what is called New Atheism. Spearheaded by prominent authors like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, no longer confining their efforts to demonstrating why gods or God can't possibly exist. They also point out the actual harm religion is causing, to society as well as to the individual. One focus of the movement is on children of religious parents, who are considered property of their parents, and therefore of their parents' religion, rather than individuals, and whose abuse is sanctioned in the name of religious freedom. The disastrous impact religious myths have on the minds of innocent children has been described by a father on Yahoo. Despite my telling the school quite clearly that we are not Christian and my daughter was not to be exposed to any violent or frightening Christian stories, my daughter was told at the age of six that God turned rivers into blood and killed all the firstborn children. She was absolutely terrified began to have trouble sleeping for thinking about it and is still very anxious and fearful. She has been referred for counseling. Francis Crick, co-discoverer of the DNA structure, suggests that Christianity may be okay between consenting adults in private, but should not be taught to young children. Information is more easily accessible than ever before since the advent of the Internet and helps to debunk some sacred myths of religion such as the one of religion providing, rather than perverting, morality, and shows that atheists are far more compassionate and law-abiding than believers. For example, crime rates in secular countries are significantly lower than in religious ones. And in the United States atheists and agnostics make up 15% of the general population, but only 0.2% of the prison population, proving that religion is as essential to morality as asparagus is to a wine tasting. While some Christians actually claim that God punishes atheists in disasters like in Fukushima or massacres like in Utoya, you won't find a single atheist, gloating over catastrophes that befall Christians, such as Hurricane Katrina. 
and when someone is hit by a tragedy such as the sudden loss of a loved one, the atheist may be speechless, but they will never be heard to make heartless comments like he's in a better place now. God had other plans for her or maybe God wanted to prevent him from becoming a sinner. Furthermore, atheists are accountable for their actions. While believers have to answer to an imaginary friend who is willing to forgive any wrongdoing and believed to even issue orders that defy all morality, atheists have to answer to themselves, and they tend to be a lot less lenient and moral than a deity when it comes to judging their own conduct. This is why nobody who was spared a religious upbringing ever became a serial killer, mass murderer or child abuser. As H. L. Mencken put it, Morality is doing right no matter what you are told. Religion is doing what you are told no matter what is right. Still, even in this day and age, some believers make statements blatantly contradicting the facts, like the cheerleader of Christian fundamentalism, Sarah Palin, who claims that Morality itself cannot be sustained without the support of religious beliefs. And even though the internet gives those who are subjected to religious oppression the chance to make their voice heard, it makes them more vulnerable to denunciation at the same time. One of many examples is Hamza Kashgari, a Saudi poet who posts a few remarks on Twitter, in which he respectfully disagrees with the Prophet Muhammad, days later almost 30,000 Facebook users demand his execution, King Abdullah calls for his arrest. Trying to flee to New Zealand in search of asylum, he is arrested in Malaysia and extradited to Saudi Arabia, where he now faces the death penalty for apostasy and blasphemy, without due process. Malaysian authorities even spread a rumor of Interpol involvement to give the operation an air of legitimacy. Genital mutilation of children for religious purposes is tolerated in every country of the world, but in 2012 a German court rules that child circumcision constitutes bodily injury and is therefore illegal. This causes quite a stir amongst Jewish and Muslim communities. And even though it is most likely that the law will be amended to allow the religious mutilation of children in the future, there are many voices in support of a ban. Believers have a tendency to be offended at any criticism of religion. And while this feeling is perfectly legitimate, just like the offense a racist may take, at the criticism of slavery or genocide, it should not cause that criticism to be hushed in the name of religious tolerance. Besides, believers tend to be blissfully ignorant of the fact that they themselves are causing grave offense to atheists by calling us sinners threatening us with eternal fire and claiming that unbelievers are morally inferior, in palpable disregard of the facts which show the opposite to be true. Only recently the religious trauma syndrome has been identified which affects all those who had or have a religious upbringing, and which is largely caused by the fear, anxiety and the feelings of guilt and self-loathing that have been planted in the children in the course of their indoctrination. If any other product was as harmful as religion, it would either be banned, or we would protect minors and vulnerable adults from it, and enforce the display of mental health warnings on all places of worship and religious media, including the supposedly holy scriptures. But as long as the majority of mankind is addicted, this won't happen. Even though it should be the other way round, there is still a lot of prejudice against atheists but I think it is fair to say that the lot of atheists in the Western world, with the possible exception of the United States, has become bearable over the past few decades when the separation of church and state was enforced. Although the fight against religious oppression continues, still, we should keep in mind the fate of those who are not so lucky, in the poorer parts of the world. There are still people who have to subscribe to a religion to be fed by missionaries, and in many cases it is the same religion that is responsible for the spread of HIV. In most Muslim countries atheists have an outlaw status with no citizens rights, and in some of them they are still put to death. Just like we were in Christian countries until a few years ago. Some atheists argue, understandably, that the term atheism shouldn't be in our vocabulary. One of them is Sam Harris who writes in letter to a Christian nation. In fact, 
Atheism is a term that should not even exist. No one ever needs to identify himself as a non-astrologer or a non-alchemist. We do not have words for people, who doubt that, Elris is still alive or that, aliens have traversed the galaxy only to molest tranchers and their cattle. Atheism is nothing more than the noises. Reasonable people make in the presence of unjustified religious beliefs. Still, I disagree with this view, as long as there is slavery, one has to be able to identify oneself as an abolitionist, as long as there is abortion. One has to be able to identify oneself as a pro-lifer, and as long as there is religion, one has to be able to identify oneself as an atheist. We won't be able to get rid of religion, just like we won't get rid of astrology or ufology. But with the rising level of education, the atheist community will continue to grow, and I imagine that, due to a snowball effect, sometime in the future, maybe in 100 years, maybe in 300, we will outnumber believers and create a society free of superstitions and injustice in which we might even be able to protect children of religious parents by outlawing indoctrinational child abuse. This may sound rather optimistic, but there are a number of reasons for this prognosis. Firstly, the number of non-believers in a personal God is a lot higher than that of self-declared atheists. Besides the closet atheists and the non-believers, who still practice religion to appease their family or because they fear to be shunned or isolated, or because they fear for their lives, as in some Muslim countries. It includes agnostics, deists, pantheists etc. And while some of these believe in a deity, none of them believe in a god who is concerned about humans, so they don't practice any rituals, follow any doctrines or pester anybody else. As the agnostic Carl Sagan said, The idea that God is an oversized white male with a flowing beard who sits in the sky and tallies the fall of every sparrow is ludicrous. But if by God one means the set of physical laws that govern the universe then clearly there is such a God. This God is emotionally unsatisfying. It does not make much sense to pray to the law of gravity. Furthermore, most believers are random believers, meaning that they automatically subscribe to the religion of their immediate environment. A devout Catholic in Ireland, would be a devout Muslim in Dubai and a devout Amish in Holmes County, as much as he would have been a devout follower of Athena in ancient Greece, therefore I am sure that somebody who is surrounded by atheists will sooner or later abandon religion altogether. Also, conversions between religion and atheism are a one-way street. While many believers finally leave their childhood indoctrination behind and become atheists, there is hardly anyone who grew up as an atheist and turns to religion. After all, can you imagine a grown man keeping a straight face when first hearing of the virgin birth? Besides all this, for the vast majority of believers the vast majority of believers amongst humans serves as evidence of their God, the Emperor's new clothes perspective. Once that vast majority starts dwindling, so will their argument. And last but not least, atheism is the natural state of man. Every child is born an atheist and only achieves the status of believer by means of conditioning, indoctrination and coercion. And the more these doctrines are questioned in society, the better the chance that the natural state will prevail. Of course religion, being the world's largest business, ahead of the armament industry which depends on it, will put up a hell of a fight. But I am sure that in the long run the majority of mankind will listen to reason.